The, um, the other area that uh, poses difficult management issues is whether or not anthracyclines should be used. Uh, obviously, the, the toxicity profiles are different, and we, we do have non-anthracycline and anthracycline regimens that have been uh, tested, although the interpretation of these is still controversial. Linda, mm -hmm. what, what, what are your thoughts on, on whether or not uh, anthracycline should be used and in what situations mm -hmm. they should be used? Well, I think um, that anthracyclines certainly have been established as a cornerstone of treatment in, in breast cancer, uh, and I certainly uh, wouldn't toss them out um, at all. I think uh, we were joking around a little bit beforehand, but I'm not really joking that, you know, it depends on what part of the country you're from, what your feeling is with regard to the anthracyclines. And so certainly uh, on the east coast of the country, and I'm not sure, uh, Bill, in, you know, the center of the country, um, you know, do you, do you use anthracyclines there? I mean, we, we do. do. We do. We do, too. Yeah. I mean, so I, so I think, um, you know, you sort of pick your patients. I mean, you know, I think you need to have a discussion, which I'm sure we all do with regard to the relative toxicities. We look at comorbidities and then sort of make a decision in conjunction with your patient, you know, which avenue they would like to go. But I will tell you, I'm very comfortable with giving anthracyclines uh, in HER2 positive patients. Is there a sense that perhaps uh, anthracyclines are superior, that for higher risk disease, maybe uh, that should be a priority? Well, I think, uh, you know, there, there's not a lot of data that's really firm that can guide us. I mean, the TCH data versus the ACTH data, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at those trials, they're fairly comparable and you end up splitting hairs on sort of toxicity issues. And I remain unconvinced that we know with certainty that one is clearly better than the other. It really comes down to sort of an issue of preference and side effects. Well, one of the things that's been pointed out about that uh, BCIRG trial is it was never intended to compare the two uh, trastuzumab arms to one another, but we all do. Mm -hmm. And the TCH arm looks about 3% inferior on every look, except for the women with four or more positive lymph nodes, and they're exactly the same. And so, uh, you know, people have very strong opinions about that. There's recent JCO editorial with a lot of good names sitting on it that are very strongly supportive of anthracyclines. Um, but as you know, uh, for some reason, even though I don't necessarily support the university that pushes TCH on the West Coast, I really embrace TCH. And I'll just um, mention that uh, uh, Maggie Chang just published in Clinical Cancer Research the um, PAM-50 intrinsic subtype thing from the old um, MA5 trial of the CEF versus the CMF and looked at this HER2 enriched population, which uh, interestingly seems to be um, mainly uh, ER negative or weakly ER positive. And that's really where the anthracycline benefit was. Now that's not a trastuzumab question, you know. Um, but it wasn't fully overlapping with her two amplified status, but you know, largely so. So at least in my mind, it raises the question in terms of you know if I'm going to angle it because I use them both. I use both the TCH being in the center of the country. I use them both, um, but I do use the um, anthracyclines for patients that don't have the cardiac risks. You know, particularly younger patients, you no know, hypertension, higher baseline LVEFs, um, and I think I'm probably more apt to to do it, thinking about this HER2 enriched population with the intrinsic subtyping. Very interesting paper, this Maggie Chang, and it's um, e ER negative uh, and more weakly ER positive, because you know, we know the endocrine therapies are quite good as well in the ER positive population. Well, that brings up the uh, other issue of cardiac toxicity, of course, uh, uh, based on what appears to be a clear trend with um, anthracyclines increasing the risk, uh, at least in the short term. Uh, we don't know long term yet. Uh, how are you all monitoring and managing cardiac toxicity? Uh, I think the clinical trials gave us a good framework upon uh, the monitoring scheme and what uh, criteria should be used for discontinuation. Uh, but of course, there's patients that always fall in between. Um, Bill, uh, any, any thoughts on, on uh, in the context of how the clinical trials did it, any uh, additional uh, features that should be monitored and, and altered? Well, I think, uh, as Joyce was mentioning, I think in patients, and again, we're talking about trastuzumab-based regimens, in patients who have some underlying cardiac risk factors, maybe older age, et cetera, you know, we may have some caution in how we think about them. I think what we've also learned over time with the follow-up of these trials is that though there are a fraction of patients that do experience cardiac toxicity, it's a pretty small number in reality, and the B31 was just 
followed up for seven years now with respect to cardiac toxicity. And even in the small fraction of patients that did experience some cardiac events, the vast majority resolved. So it did speak to the issue that for most part it happens early, it's reversible, and most patients can continue on therapy. Um, I think within the framework of the clinical trials, people were evaluating cardiac function you know, every four to six months, and probably in clinical practice there's still probably some loosening of those um, you know, rigid uh, clinical trial parameters, but people still follow cardiac function through treatment and then probably uh, at the end of treatment as well.